Chapter 7. Budget for the Short Term Management by objectives works if you first think through your objectives. 90% of the time, you haven't. Peter Drucker The conventional definition of management is getting work done through people. But real management is developing people through work. Aga Hassan Abedi Managers can plan. They can dream dreams of the future for their firms. However, for their plans or dreams to connect to reality, for them to be implemented, for them to lead to actions that will help achieve their plans, other people besides managers are going to have to do something. And it will not just be any old something, any sort of actions. It will need to be actions consistent with the plans or dreams of the managers of a firm. Actions that will significantly and directly help achieve the plans of managers. Managers not only need to plan and dream dreams, they need to communicate their plans, objectives and dreams to others in their firm. They need to bring others along with them, to lead them, to have others want to contribute to their plans, to be part of the bigger vision. Managers can do this through personal contact with others, through words, through genuine personal interest and care for others, through communicating a laser-like focus on an objective, through demonstrating determination and perseverance, and through a clearly seen personal commitment to the value of the task ahead. There also needs to be precision in the communication from managers about what they expect from others if managers are to direct the future action of others. While flying across the Tasman Sea between Australia and New Zealand, it occurred to me I had probably been walking the distance between Sydney in Australia and Wellington in New Zealand each year for the previous few years. It is a bit over 2,000 kilometres between Sydney and Wellington. I used to have a house in Karori, a suburb in Wellington, perched about 250 metres above sea level. For many years, most working days, I walked between Karori and Wellington CBD, which is nestled at sea level on one of the world's great harbours. It is a four to five kilometre walk each way, so the return trip is about nine kilometres. I did the return trip five times a week. I would walk about 45 kilometres a week, and over, say, 45 weeks a year, it would be about 2,000 kilometres a year. This would be roughly the distance between Sydney and Wellington. In more recent times, I have instead been walking along the beach from my apartment in Yapoon, Queensland, about three kilometres north and back again early each morning. That is a trip of about six kilometres each day. If I do this every day of the week, I'm walking over 40 kilometres a week. In a year, I would walk much the same distance as I used to in New Zealand. So the 2,000 kilometre walks I've been doing each year in Wellington and now more recently in Yapoon sound like very long walks. But they start with just one step as I close the front door and step down from my home each day. Just one small step. I could never walk 2,000 kilometres or more each year, which would be 20,000 kilometres or more each decade, unless I took that first step out of my front door. My first step. A lot does not happen in our world because we do not take the first step on a long journey. Managers need to support people to take their first step and the second and subsequent steps that will collectively take the firm in the desired direction that will cause the dreams flowering in the minds of managers to gradually struggle into reality and see the light of day. This chapter is about how accounting can help or hinder managers to clearly communicate their plans to others in a firm and to facilitate them collectively and in a coordinated way to do things that will help achieve managers' plans in the short term. In this chapter, we are looking at the first steps in what can often be very long journeys for firms. Not necessarily the first steps in the sense of a new firm being started up and lurching forward in the first steps of its new corporate life. 
Rather, it is the first steps in the sense of the next steps, the short term, taking the first steps from where we are currently to help us move forward in the short term to where we want to be going as a firm. In this chapter, we'll be looking at how budgets can help managers communicate their plans to others and ensure that the resources of a firm are used in the short term in a way that is consistent with the overall objectives of a firm. If we do not take the next steps in the direction we want to be going, we will never get to where we want to go. In this chapter, we will ask ourselves whether accounting can really help, or is it more likely to hinder, managers to communicate their plans and ensure resources of their firms are used in the short term in a way that is consistent with their plans. This is because managers need to get work done through people. But of course, people are the end, not the work. Firms operate for people, for all those with a genuine interest in what a firm does. As far as the firm's staff is concerned, management is about developing people through work. This is the way to get the work done and to achieve managers' dreams for a firm. In this chapter, let us consider whether accounting can really help managers ensure others take these all-important first steps in a business. 7.1. Reasons for budgeting. A budget is just a method of worrying before you spend money, as well as afterward. Anon. The reason for budgeting is to ensure the detailed short-term implementation of managers' plans takes place. Or is it? In practice, budgets are usually for a one-year period, broken down into monthly and sometimes weekly or daily budgets. They focus on the next steps, the first steps in the rest of the journey of a firm. Budgets can potentially have several advantages for a firm. These can include encouraging short-term planning, encouraging coordination and cooperation within a firm, communicating clearly and precisely managers' plans, delegating responsibility and accountability to others, and motivating staff. Indeed, it is a little surprise, it is little surprise that for almost all businesses, budgeting is an integral part of their management accounts. But does budgeting really do these things? A question we will ask ourselves in this section is, how could it? Short-term planning. Budgets can provide a discipline to managers at different levels in a firm to focus on setting short-term targets consistent with the overall objectives of a firm. This can help everyone foresee potential future issues in the short term before they happen before everyone is embroiled in fighting fires or in an emergency. For example, budgeting or planning cash levels in a firm can help managers foresee potential cash shortages in the future before they happen. This gives the opportunity to fix a problem before it becomes a problem. In budgets, words can be used as well as numbers, but mostly they are made up of numbers. Most of the numbers have dollar signs in front of them, and the numbers are the plan and the dreams and the ideas. They are specific and precise. Everything seems to come down to the dollars. At least life starts to seem simpler. Or does it? Or could it? Coordinate. As well as providing discipline for short-term planning, budgets can also provide a vehicle for different parts of a firm to talk to each other and to coordinate aspects of their activities so they are more in line with the overall objectives of a firm. Budgets can add a crispness and clarity to these communications. Crisp salads are good, and so are crisp communications. Everyone knows where they stand and where they sit. The budgets can make it very clear what is expected of different parts in an organisation and how those parts are going to need to talk to each other and work together. Yes, work together. With or without budgets, why can that be such a difficult thing for people to do in firms? Communicate. 
Budgets can also provide a vehicle for managers to communicate their objectives and strategies clearly and precisely, and what they mean for the short-term or immediate actions of groups and individuals in a firm. It is all very well to have a roadmap for the future into the years ahead for a firm, but to get there, the first steps need to be taken by other people. Budgets can help make clear to others throughout a firm what those first steps are or might be. Individuals, a whole lot of individuals, need to know what is expected of them, what their part is in the journey the firm wants to go on. People need to know whether they even have a part to play, a part that might count for something in the bigger plan. If the messages are made clear, it is certainly a start. It is a very important start, indeed a key start to a firm taking the first steps in going forward. Delegate. Having said this, it is not possible nor desirable for managers of a firm to plan in detail what every individual in a firm needs to do moment by moment in their job. To communicate this to every individual and then to check up on everyone to make sure they are doing everything, every detail, exactly as managers want them to do it. It is not possible because to do so would require managers to not only have eyes in the back of their heads, but to have a lot of eyes. Indeed, each human being, regardless of whether they are a manager of a firm or not, only has two eyes. That is right, just the two. So we are limited. Also, even if it was possible, it would not be desirable for managers to plan every detail. This is because managers do not know everything. In fact, some people in firms think managers do not know anything. As firms get larger, as their scope and reach and influence gets larger, managers need to delegate more and more decision making to others. This means people will have considerable scope to act within the often broad boundaries of the overall objectives and goals of a firm. We must trust people. Well, at least within reason within clear guidelines, boundaries, and parameters. We like to place some limits around our trust of others, particularly when we are giving them other people's money to say nothing about our dreams as managers to play around with. There should be some limits to reduce our potential disappointments. Otherwise, we might become too disappointed and give up on our dreams and plans and imagined futures, or indeed lose our jobs as managers. Our dreams and careers are too valuable to be handed over willy-nilly to others. We need to delegate clearly and with precise boundaries. Budgets, because they are in numbers, can help us do this. Motivate. Also, we all need to get up in the morning. We must leave our soft, warm bed and roll out of the sheets and head into the shower. We must get out of the front door of our home and head into work and stay there all day. Each day it comes down to whether we want to be there or not, whether we want to be somewhere else, whether we believe in what we are doing or not. Budgets can help motivate us in the short term, make it clear what we should do. Motivation is having the motive force to do something, the internal motor that pushes us forward to the goal. We need that each day. Indeed, each step of the way as we fulfil the requirements of a firm's short-term plans. Budgets can do this for people in a firm. They can do this for you and me. Maybe. These are all potential benefits of budgeting. To coordinate, communicate, delegate and motivate. A lot of words ending in eight. All these words involve people. They involve the effect of words and numbers on real people who are usually just trying to live their lives. Most firms budget. Indeed, as you enter the management ranks in a firm, one of the first things you'll be confronted with is being responsible for a budget for your team or group within a firm. All the potential advantages of using budgets for a firm revolve around people in a firm. Budgets can encourage people to plan in the short term encourage people to talk to each other and to coordinate their activities across a firm and encourage detailed communication from managers to people of what is expected of them in the short term. 
Budgets can help delegate responsibility to people within a firm and help motivate them to act in ways consistent with managers' plans and objectives. And, of course, managers are people too. Everything seems to involve end-to-end -end people and that is where budgeting can come unstuck. The benefits of budgeting, the reasons why so many firms do it, revolve around the potentially favourable impacts of budgeting on people. These favourable impacts involve helping managers ensure other people in a firm act on a day-to-day -day basis in a way consistent with managers' vision, dreams, plans and objectives for a firm. Can budgets really do this? One thing we know about people, being of course human beings ourselves, is that we are all thinking, living people with our own dreams, desires and aims. We are people, not machines. We have our own intentions and plans. These may or may not line up particularly well with those of the firm we work for. Yet for managers to achieve their plans, aims and objectives for a firm, other people need to act in ways consistent with them. How can budgets help managers and other people do this? Indeed, can they? We are sitting in the United Club Lounge in Terminal 2 at Heathrow Airport in London, waiting for a plane. Sipping a light beer and looking out the window, we see a Singapore Airlines plane arrive at Gate 8 nearby. Various people come scurrying out to service the plane, including a group of baggage handlers. We see one baggage handler grab the first bag off the plane and run off with it and disappear into the terminal building. At first, we think the person has, for some inexplicable reason, brazenly stolen the bag and disappeared. We have another sip on our beer and wonder whether perhaps we should report to someone what we have just seen. Inside the terminal, the person has loaded the bag onto the conveyor belt that takes it onto the baggage carousel. This lonely bag arrives on the bag baggage carousel and starts circling round and round before its owner has even stopped, stepped out of the plane's door and onto the air bridge. The bag continues its lonely vigil while its owner proceeds through customs and heads to the baggage carousel. The bag then greets its surprised owner who promptly grabs it, puts it on their trolley and waits patiently for their second bag. After quite a long wait, eventually the rest of the bags appear on the baggage carousel. Sipping our beers in the United Club lounge, we do not see what happens inside the terminal. But we do see the baggage handler who ran with the bag into the terminal re-emerge onto the tarmac and saunter slowly back to the plane and join the other baggage handlers unloading the rest of the bags. We comment to each other about the mysteries of running airports and how important that passenger must have been for their bag to receive such special treatment and how that never seems to happen to our bags. That one bag got onto the baggage carousel ready for someone to take it very, very quickly. Why did the baggage handler do this? What was the point? Managers of Heathrow Airport know customers like to be able to get their bags off the baggage carousel as soon as possible after they get off their plane. So they decide to set up a performance target of minimising the time it takes from when a plane docks at a gate to when the first bag gets onto the baggage carousel. The baggage handlers got a bonus if they met certain targets for the time taken to do this. And did this incentive work? The time taken to get the first bag off the plane and onto the baggage carousel plummeted and the baggage handlers got some handy bonuses. But did the customers get their bags off the baggage carousel any earlier? Well, no, except for the owner of the one bag that got the special express service. Managers soon realised this was not working, so they changed the target to the time taken for the last bag to get onto the baggage carousel. Managers thought this might work a bit better, but it did not. Bags did not get onto the baggage carousel any faster. The reason for this was that there were often bags recorded as being on a flight that were put on the wrong flight or for some other reason did not make it onto the flight they were supposed to be on. So often the last bag did not get onto the baggage carousel for a day or more after the flight had landed, regardless of when the other bags were placed 
onto the baggage carousel. So this target did not work either. Managers then decided to set the target as the fourth last bag to be loaded onto the baggage carousel, which tells you something about how many bags might often get misplaced on each flight. This target worked quite well to help baggage handlers reduce the time they took to unload bags from a flight. Motley, 2007. What does this story about the baggage handlers show us? It shows us managers need to be very careful when setting targets and objectives for people in their firm. Whether those targets are in numbers, such as time taken to unload the first bag from a flight, or in financial terms, that is numbers with dollar signs in front of them. Managers need to think carefully about the links between the target measure and the behaviour of people and the outcome they are seeking to support and encourage by the target. Very often managers do not think carefully about this and set targets that can give the wrong incentives for people in a firm. In fact, with setting budgets it can be even more complicated and difficult. This is because managers often set targets and budgets for outcomes for which they themselves will be held accountable. So why set the target too high? Often people can put in some slack or wriggle room into their budgets. They can pad out the costs in their budgets and underestimate revenue. The reason this is a serious problem with budgeting is that the people who set budgets for part of a business usually know more about that aspect of the business than those who will use the budgets to assess their performance. As a rule, I found it best not to tie managers' bonuses to performance compared to budgets. If you do, there will invariably be so much game playing in the setting of budgets that it will be difficult to have confidence in the reasonableness of the forecasts underlying the budgets. This section has looked at the reasons for budgeting. We've seen the central reason for a firm to budget is to support the detailed short-term implementation of managers' plans for a firm. The use of accounting in the form of budgets to help managers do this is probably more of an art than a science. In the next section, we will consider some of the issues with preparing budgets and using accounting to help managers implement their plans in the short term through the actions of others. As we do this, remember all of this involves people and not simply numbers on a piece of paper. It involves engagement of people in a firm with managers plans, dreams and objectives. 7.2 Preparing Budgets I find shoestrings very hard work. I like big budgets. Julie Harris The budget evolved from a management tool into an obstacle to management. Frank C. Calusi this section discusses how budgets are prepared in a firm. We will look at who is best placed to prepare budgets for a firm, how budgets from various aspects of a firm can be brought together into an integrated master budget, and how budgets can help us hold people accountable for parts of a business. Participative budgeting. Never base your budget requests on realistic assumptions, as this could lead to a decrease in your funding. Scott Adams. Wellington is the capital city of New Zealand. It was first settled by Europeans in 1840. It was surveyed and designed to have a thousand one acre sections of land in the town centre, surrounded by a green town belt. Outside the town belt were 1,100 acre sections. The plans of Wellington, including the layout of the roads, were finalised in London, in the UK, by people who had never been to Wellington. They had never made the arduous and dangerous voyage from London. Dixon Street in Wellington goes in a nice straight line from Courtney Place, now an entertainment district in Wellington, crosses Willis Street and ends at the terrace. The only problem is that Wellington is very hilly and there is about a 40 metre steep rise from Willis Street to the terrace. The plan for Dixon Street has the road going straight up, essentially a cliff. That is how road maps in Wellington still have it. 
The only thing is the road stops between Willow Street and the terrace and there are steps you need to walk up to get up the cliff to the rest of Dixon Street. You certainly cannot drive up it. So why is Dixon Street like this? Why design a road to go straight up a cliff? The reason is those who designed the road and others like it in Wellington were never on the ground and did not consider the fact that Wellington is extremely hilly. To those in London looking at the maps of Wellington, it looked like everything was flat. It is like this with setting budgets. Budgets are a design for a firm's short-term future. Who should put these designs together? Should it be someone sitting in head office who may never have set foot in some of the factories, warehouses or retail stores of a firm? And who may never have even met many of the staff who will have to carry out the budget? Or should it be people on the ground working at the coalface of different aspects of a firm's operations? Participative budgeting is when lower level managers and staff are part of the process of preparing budgets. I was a director of Donaghy's for several years. At the time, Donaghy's made and sold many products, including a range of rope and cordage products. The budgeting process would start with the sales budget being prepared for each of Donaghy's products. For example, various types of baling twine, such as Advantage 5000, Bulky 240 and Big Blue, Russell muscle ropes such as Aquatuff, and yachting braids such as Yachtmaster XS and Dockline. Sales managers would prepare the sales budgets. Production managers, those responsible for manufacturing the products, would prepare production budgets, setting out how much of each product could be produced in the factories. Any issues between the sales budgets and the production budgets would be negotiated and discussed between the sales managers and production managers, with the general manager sales and general manager production negotiating major issues of concern. The managing director would be involved, ensuring the overall budget was consistent with the longer term strategic plan of the firm, which he had negotiated with the directors. There might be quite a degree of interaction and going back and forward between various managers before a draft budget would be presented by the managing director to the board of directors. This draft budget would be discussed by the board and usually some aspects would be sent back for further negotiation and development. This would continue until a budget was established for Donaghy's that the board felt was realistic and a stretch for the firm and met the requirements of the private equity investors in Donaghy's in terms of return on investment. At this point, the Board of Directors of Donaghy's would approve the budget. In this way, participative budgeting is where managers at various levels of a firm are genuinely involved in the preparation of budgets. If we feel we've been involved in the setting of targets and goals, we're likely to have greater buy-in and commitment to doing the work required to help make the plans a reality. Like any good idea, or any good painting for that matter, fakes and cheap imitations can abound. Managers who may have little real skill or capacity for the challenges and personal engagement of leadership can seek to fake participative budgeting. These managers may set the budgets and plans themselves and then go through the charade of involving others in preparing plans and budgets. And wouldn't you know it, everyone ends up agreeing to set the budgets and plans the manager wanted in the first place. Besides the obvious lack of integrity on the part of managers who deceive their staff in this way, who are the very people they will rely on to carry out the plans, such, such imitation participative budgeting does not work. This is because people are not stupid. They usually see it for what it is and they do not like it. Better to be upfront and simply say these are the budgets so let us all get on with it rather than pretend lower level managers and staff have a genuine input into their preparation when they do not. Believe it or not, people do not appreciate being lied to, particularly by those purporting to be their leaders in firms. However, 
Where there is genuine participative budgeting by people throughout a firm, with everyone clear on the extent to which they can meaningfully contribute to the formulation of budgets, we then need to pull together all the budgets and plans from various parts of the firm into a coherent whole. After all, in each firm, there is only one firm. Master budgets. Coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. Henry Ford. All the budgets for various aspects of a firm, such as sales, marketing, production, distribution, customer service, human resources, finance and administration, are usually brought together in a master budget. A master budget is typically made up of a cash budget, a budgeted income statement and a budgeted balance sheet. It is a summary of the individual budgets for each function of a firm. A major benefit of preparing budgets is that they represent a future virtual world for a firm. A budget is an expected future that has not yet happened and is based on various things happening in the short term which people in the firm can work towards. The power of budgets is that they can help us anticipate events before they happen and so give us the opportunity to act now before we find ourselves in an emergency. Now time lags are not a manager's friend. Managers need to respond quickly to the changing events of a firm. At one level, budgets help managers foresee potential issues in advance and so can help them react to potential situations before they occur. That is a mighty short time lag, a sort of negative time lag. This can be much more effective than seeking to do something after the event. Yet a common issue in firms of any size is lack of coordination between different activities in a firm. One common area of disconnect or conflict can be between the sales and production activities of a firm. Sales and production budgets. It is vital the various activities of a firm are coordinated. One key area is to ensure the budgeted production levels are consistent with the budgeted sales volumes and the budgeted inventory levels. In volume terms, production plus opening inventory equals sales plus closing inventory. Our opening inventory is how much of a product we have at the beginning of a budget period. It is common to budget for a one year period. Production is how much we produce in the period. Production plus opening inventory is how much of the product we have available to sell in the period. Sales plus closing inventory is where this product will end up in a period. It will either be sold to customers or retained in inventory in our warehouses or retail stores. If we are planning to sell more of a product than we can produce in a period, plus what we have in inventory at the beginning of the period, then we have a problem. We are planning to run out of stock, which means problems with unhappy customers, stressed sales assistants, grumpy sales managers, unmet sales budgets and unmet profit targets for the firm. Budgets can help us see such looming problems in a virtual world of accounting and budgets before they enter the real world of our firm. This gives us the opportunity to address problems before anything happens. Sales budgets will be developed by sales staff responsible for achieving them, building up the sales budget from forecasts for sales of each product. The sales managers will consider what is reasonable to achieve based on their understanding of customers, competitors' actions and other relevant factors on the ground. Sales managers are usually the best people to assess these things. But of course the sales managers will be expected to achieve these targeted sales and their personal remuneration may be linked to achieving them. Sales managers might seek some fat in their sales budgets to make it easier for them to achieve or exceed their sales targets. Senior managers will usually to some extent seek to outguess the sales managers on this and vice versa. In the same way, production managers will seek to forecast what production levels are achievable for each product. For example, sales managers may be keen to sell products for which there is strong customer demand 
and to offer it in a range of colors and with other features which customers prefer. Production managers are usually keen to ensure their production facilities operate efficiently with long production runs of reasonably standard products. The plans of sales managers may place considerable strain on the production facilities to deliver the quantities of products the sales managers want. There needs to be a bit of give and take between the sales and production managers. And most importantly, the sales and production budgets need to be consistent with each other and to tightly dovetail with each other. We have seen how the various budgets for each part of a business can be combined into a master budget, which often involves a cash budget, a budgeted income statement and a budgeted balance sheet. This master budget is a summary of the budgets for each function or aspect of a firm. A master budget helps ensure all the budgets of the firm are consistent with each other and fit together into a virtual future world that might be possible for a firm. When we enter the management ranks of a firm, we can expect to be confronted with budgets for which we will be held responsible. What might they, what might they look like and what might they be trying to tell us? We will consider these questions in the next section as we have a look at two of the budgets in a master or overall budget for a firm, the cash budget and the budgeted income statement.